This year we touched several topics, we still have a couple uh, to go before the end of the year, but one that could not be missed was one that our fans and visitors requested us last year. So everyone strongly requested us to talk about the GTA, the 147 and 156, and to go a little beyond, so not to talk only about the cars that were produced, but also about the cars that were uh, conceived. For example, all, some were presented, like the 156 GTM presented at Motor Show, but some were never uh, presented to the public. So let's start to talk about these uh, cars, not introducing their history, because probably you know it very well. Some of you own it, some of you drove it, some of you probably studied it. But the 156 and then 147 GTA were presenting at a certain point of the history of Alfa Romeo, uh, evoking a name, a little bit betraying the identity, because these were not lighter than a normal 156, but they followed the trend of tribute that started already in the 155 GTA, which won the Super Turismo Championship in 92, so in the world of races, then with 156 and 147, and more recently with the Giulia GTA, which was presented uh, what sold last year. In this case, we are talking about a period of Alfa Romeo when things were going very well. The 156, when it was presented, received 60,000 orders even before delivering the first car. It would be a great success of image, a commercial success, 680,000 cars sold. And this is also the result of a range which expanded over time and reaching the cars with technologies, versions, engines, and innovations, but also being cited by other models like 147 and the GT, which not only had a success in their own, but also made more financially viable the production of the 156, because when the 147 was presented, costs could be cut, and the Alfa Romeo in that period could thrive. From the technological point of view, those were the years when uh, the evolution of the turbo diesel common road were continuously presented, and these were always on the front pages and the headlines of the um, presentation press releases, but working on the image, there was a sports activity which was very lively, 156 in the end, would won 13 championships of pilots, teams, builders, running in the different uh, championships and the 147 would then uh, give light to a, a mono brand championship which would uh, be the test for many young pilots. So all this activity of product, image and sports then uh, arrived at the presentation of the 156 and 147 on the top of the range. But as always, I want to stop here and call on the stage, the guest that we invited, Wilfredo Binda, please join us on stage. Sergio Truzzi and Nicola D'Amico. Please. Accomodatevi. Tutti, tutti. On the 156 and 147 GT8, we could talk a lot on the intentions that brought it to be uh, marketed, how they were sold, the modifications of the chassis, uh, mostly of fine tuning and uh, sometimes uh, of the chassis just to uh, host bigger wheels, but the heart of this project, which is also the aspect which is mostly communicated by Alfa Romeo at the time, is the engine. That's why we invited uh, engineers specifically working on engines that told us how this engine was born, which is the evolution of the engine which was born in 1979, and how this engine passed through different eras, but always remaining at the top of the categories, and especially in the heart of the fans. So, let's start from Valfrido, who brought us a chart 
Here is the microphone. So please introduce yourself. Good afternoon. My name is Valfrido Binda. I've been for many years of my career and responsible for developing engines, the six cylinders um, during the last part of my career, and I follow very closely the birth of the GTA version. I stayed up to when this engine was phased out, which was around at the end of 2005, even though the plant of Arese stopped the production of this engine one year before. So how the GTA history was born? Let's start from this chart. You see it is hand drawn because at the time it was easier and faster than the computer. So how was it born? Well, I'm not saying that it was born in front of the coffee machine uh, because it would betray our uh, common work, but it was born out of a discussion on how to unleaven and how to give some elements of innovations on the six cylinders engine of Arese, which at the time was limited to the 2500 three and 3000 versions. So I remember that when I started to talk about this with my boss of the time, late Mr. Lanati, we said, well, let's try and see. So the idea was to play a little bit on the length of the strokes. Why? Because intervention had to be a minimum also uh, from the financial point of view. So from this chart, you can see that the original stroke was 66 and 68 well, for the turbo and then the 62 6 millimeters you see in red which were uh, those produced at the time the idea was to have 78 millimeters for everyone without having to uh, change the, the crankshaft, these millimeters are a physical limitation, a, a physical limitation due by the, the crankshaft with its components and the head, which should not interfere in the area of camps and the basement. So it was a physical limitation, otherwise we would have changed the base as well. So 78 millimeters. So, at the moment when we drew this chart, it was not easy because then when we talk about the plant in Arese, we were a big family, so there was dialogue between the different departments every day. So, talking with the plant, we heard that there was on the crankshaft a lot of uh, metal so we thought whether it was a possibility the opportunity without doing a lot of uh, modification to have a longer stroke and that is what happened of course i i, I think i can say this it was not a uh, done under the light because the technologies were left aside, otherwise we would have had costs and processes, so together with the person responsible for mm, the plant of Arese and the product engineer, we were able to test some crankshafts with the 78 strokes and we started the, the test with the engines. Let's say that we didn't have huge problems because the engine was working uh, smoothly. There were no particular problems of reliability. Uh, just we had one critical situation, which was the possible increase of cylinders at 3,500. Then there were versions. I drove these versions and some are still there, as Sergio Truzzi can say, but in terms of production, we had some worries. So some engines were built, 
The particularity is that the number start with 35, so they are called 35001, 002, up to 007. So, the preambules were there, maybe. So the occasion arrived with the GTA. So we, we started to talk about this version because up to that point everything stayed on paper, you know, asking for a new authorization in a situation in which you, you knew that the, the engine would die sooner or later was a kind of difficult. So the idea was to have a GTA version. And this GTA version was born through some meetings with managers that usually were held on a Friday morning in Kivasso where there was the Lancia plant and where there, were, where there was the sports management and direction. So the car had a slightly different attitude compared to the one that would then be produced because in the beginning it was more similar to the 147, recalling the GTA, the hood, the trunk, the doors in aluminum, just to recall the GTA, which means Gran Turismo Alleggerita. You know this better than me. This is another graphic. July the 30th, 98. It's another graphic representation of what I told you. So the GTA, but also on the engine, there were some innovations. There were not only the increase in displacement, but we wanted to have a carbon fiber a box. This is the Auto Delta version, but in reality, I remember that at the fifth floor office of the Centro Tenco there was a version which was a little bit smaller than this one, always in carbon fiber, with the GTA logo in red and lettering. This also unfortunately was abandoned due to reasons of noise and possible problems of reliability over time. So this is what was presented for the increase in displacement. As I was telling you, well, the increase in displacement doesn't have to do with the rest, but with increasing the stroke to 78 millimeters and the unification, there was a thought of doing also a 2800 version, but the product Mm, could, didn't think that it could be successful in the Alfa Romeo uh, fans. As I said, well, if 2800 is strange, or th so 3200 is strange, but anyway, some engines were realized. One was also put on 156, and I must say that it was quite impressive because the increase in performances that uh, this engine had uh, going from 2500 to 2800 were very important, especially at low revs, uh, the torque was uh, higher than its uh, sister or brother. Well, uh, it, then it didn't go on, but we can see here some documents of when it was presented and you see that 2800 was uh, cancelled. There is a 2800 and 300 200 with this application because once the engine was mounted on the GTA, it was also extended to the 166 model and also on the Lancia Thesis, which in the meantime had a 3000 W6, the original one, also on the Thesis Lancia that unfortunately didn't have a great success. This engine 3.2 liters was implemented. So here we see other drawings. The size in the end remained the same. Basically, the interventions made were increasing the, uh, the displacement a different phasing uh, from the aspiration side, while the exhaust was the same. Of course, a little change on the pistons to maintain the same length. Of the uh, rod head and for the rest, apart from the little box with the GTA 
3000 W6 lettering, it was almost unrecognizable, even though inside something uh, important changed. So this was the product chart of the 3200W6 engine, you see here 240 because it was the 240 horsepower version with a little bit less uh, power which was mounted on the 166, here we have more specifications, the performance curve, you see here the increase in the torque both in terms of maximum torque but, torque, but also at low revs. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a, the curves of the 3000, but I assure you, it was very evident, uh, it was visible. Let's see what we have here. Well, the comparison between 12 and 24 valves between the heads, especially from the aspiration side. But when the GTA was presented, great attention was devoted to explaining why they wanted to increase the calibration to improve the drivability, uh, just forgetting or well, going beyond what was the previous experience that is excessive power the previous generation of six cylinders had had some turbo versions. Nicola, you can tell us something about the one you mounted uh, in an experimental way, and we also have a, 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 a car here in the museum with the two turbo. Yes, hello everyone, I'm a friend, Nicola. I always work with turbo engines um, since 85 with the presentation of 1964. And, uh, this test to us or hard sometimes, because for some technicians, it, some things were exaggerated, but this was the Alfa Romeo system. So uh, it, we talk about uh, six cylinders, a mono turbo, but there were also bi turbo, but in the spare time, some of us did some experiments. So I had the experience of uh, trying a bi turbocharged engine at a zero cost and on a Saturday. You went there unofficially to create a bi turbocharged, and, and we drove at 280 horsepower, 100 hours, well, eight hours without never stopping the engine. It, it, it was eight minutes. Uh, if, uh, eight minutes at full throttle, then one minute uh, to the minimum, then eight minutes uh, full throttle, and again for eight, nine hours. And the next day you started again, total of 100 hours with 180 horsepower, and it was a bi turbocharged engine. So my colleagues uh, reminded uh, that they were called generous engines because you could treat them like that, but they performed. Uh, without anomalies. So I also talk, uh, I dealt with other parts of the engine, but there were no problems. There were no defects, also the dealer said that. This was the engine that now is phased out. As I said, it was a very generous uh, engine, giving great satisfaction. So, this means that it was a good project. And my colleague, said that when the box motor was at 100, 100 it was, uh, was 1100, it was brought to 1700, but the basement was always the same. So it means that the project was a very valid project, and that was also happened with the six cylinders of the Alfa Romeo. Well, that's it.
After the presentation of the GTA, for some time nothing happened and then suddenly it was decided everything that went on the racetrack had to be called GTA. So the 147 that up to the year before was called, uh, was running, the, uh, racing the 147 cup was called 147 GTA Cup, the 156 that with the 2000 engine race in the tourism uh, European started to be called 147 GTA, even though it's always the same car, always the same uh, settings, it was just a communication things. And there a new push was given to the communication of the GTA uh, range and suddenly Without anticipations at the Motor Show of Bologna in 2002, this model was presented with some modifications, parts in aluminum, and the engine was at 3500 and it was presented at the uh, booth of Alfa Romeo, but as a project of N technology, which at the time, well, a uh, former Nord Auto was the uh, racetrack department of Alfa Romeo, which uh, brought on the tracks the 156 and 147 winning in the Turismo category. So, suddenly, the audience uh, receives the news that they were working on higher calibration. Uh, and higher displacement. You see that is mounting a 3300 uh, engine. You know all the characteristics, the torque, etc. But a series of cars started to be seen around that starting from the GTA went beyond. And not only in 2002 at the Motor Show it was presented with the N technology uh, brands, but also in 2004 and even more when the uh, 3500 mechanics was presented on a, on a sports wagon GTA with a restyling Giugiaro uh, chassis with the Auto Delta uh, logo because in the meantime the N technology always work with the logistics and development and of the racetracks but the racetrack department was uh, called racetrack department auto delta so the next uh, version was uh, called auto delta and it had this box with an auto delta logo well a, a replica of the auto delta of the previous years while at the geneva exhibition in 2004 when it was presenting that was cut and made transparent in order to see the uh, internal parts. So, Valfrido, you hinted at the evolutions beyond the 3200 and here it is. Yes, as I was saying before, always in view of maintaining the uh, stroke at 78 millimeters, we saw the possibility of doing a 3500 version. So you see here the performance curve. The black one is the 3200 uh, version, the GTA, the basic one, with 30 uh, kilograms and um, torque almost 250 horsepower. Then we have two versions of uh, 3500, one with a, a modified uh, end tip on one side and the other with the same of the GTA. You see the increase in performances almost 280-285 horsepower with a torque of 27-33-34-35-36 kilograms per meter. So as I said before it's 0, zero one but 35 35 uh, 35 so from one to seven is the branding of the engines and we had some worries because going to 98 bore in the back part the circulation of water was narrowed uh, around the last cylinder is it true or not well, there was no detailed experimentation, so the engine uh, was tested a little bit, well, not during the 500 hours, but 
To my memory, we didn't have great problems, but from there to launching it for the series, well, I must be honest, both me and my uh, boss were a little bit startled at why we didn't push a lot, because also we didn't seem to see a lot of interest in, in terms of a mass-produced product. It is also true that, as Lorenzo Tizio said, someone did it. I mean, some engines also of higher displacement is still around, even though a like, dozen of years have gone by. But something is going to see when you use such power. So from this point of view, maybe it's also logical. But at the time, let's say that our methods, our procedures so of uh, approving the production were kind of strict. So always uh, knowing that there were not many funds and not, there was not so much money to spend, we decided to keep it like that. So at least this is what I recall. And then meanwhile, those who visit the collection of the Alfa Romeo Museum know that there are other uh, cars mounting this motor. One is a 166, never presented officially, which has a small lettering, a 166 GTAM, like the 156, which uh, has installed the 3500 engine. Another 3500 engine was tested for a long time on a 147 GTA uh, with Q4, three differentials, and a single mechanics, uh, well, uh, it had an accident, it was disassembled and reassembled on another chassis, there's only one, and it is exposed in the museum's exhibition. The uh, four-wheel traction solved one of the problems that uh, 147 and 156 have on the front wheel uh, drive, but not the brake problem which was a different one, but the transformation from a front wheel drive to uh, the four wheel drive was not easy. Yes, no, it was not easy. These are some, these are some studies that were carried out at that time. This is the differential. And you see that the impact was high on the sump, on the oil sump. Had it been only for the oil sump, well, the thing could have been easily solved. The problem was that it touched the oil pump, which is this one in light blue, that would have required a repositioning. And of course, all the activities connected to the fact that you had to modify a fundamental component for the correct functioning of the engine. So, always knowing that we analyze everything. You see here the new sump, the new fixing parts, the new oil duct. Well, the fact of having to do this support to fix it well, left a little bit startled, but again, the thing remained on a standby. And then I must be honest, in 2006, well, at the beginning of 2006, I left Alfa Romeo. So the history of what happened afterwards it was just told me by my former colleagues because I, I was in contact with them. So you see possible interference. The, the sump was maintained. Okay, so. Let's say that for these changes that were financially important, again, seeing the figures, the project didn't go through, at least until I was in Alfa Romeo. It is true that then someone did it. Someone did it, but something is to do this on a few vehicles, another on a mass production, even though small, but has to uh, withstand tests of length, which are expensive, of course. And we see here new position, old position, 
then we also try to displace a little bit the central differential but until I remain this study was maintained so this is the history until I stayed in alpha and in any way you needed a specific differential box so again more investments that probably would not have been justified seeing the numbers of such a, a car meanwhile the years go by agreements with other brands over sign and we know that the next generation the 159 would install different engines and many projects would stop but the history of the six cylinders 2002 and then with later displacements continues outside Alfa Romeo and Sergio Truzzi can talk a little bit about this right yes good afternoon my name is Sergio Truzzi and I dealt with the application of the electronics of the engine controls let's say that in the main factor of Alfa Romeo the topic of increasing the displacement was treated quite deeply but at one point it had to stop due to industrial reasons there were no enough resources to justify the modification of the engine but this attempt of doing an evolution continued let's say outside of Alfa Romeo so I want to tell you in this presentation something how to say about the most important change that I saw on this engine that is to go to 3700 it was something that was made around 2004-2005 this is an image of the engine of this 3700 you see nothing specific or different but 3700 was obtained through an increase in the bore of the pistons so going from 93 which was the original in Alfa Romeo to 101 so according to renowned technicians and designers it was something riskful but in reality the engines worked well and some of them is still running well today and all this allowed the performances of these engines to to go to incredible performances i mean so the engine could easily go to 300 horsepower but what was different mainly the piston and the cams all the rest the pipes the valves etc they all remain the same it was a relatively cheap change something that can be made by someone who has a, a not an, an industry but a small uh, car shop for example so apart from increasing the displacement to 3700 the aspiration the suction of the engine was helped through butterfly valves which were increased using the uh, Ferrari 360 once just a few millimeters 
it was not fundamental. But still, in front of those of, of the potential buyer, well, <laughs> they were nice to, to see. Hi, here we have some examples of light preparations. There were some preparators who prepared the air filters with modified ducts in carbon, for example, or applied specific cams that could make a little difference, but nothing huge. And this is an example of a new exhaust pipe that could be proposed to increase a little bit the performances. So generally, generally these also remove the catalyzers and use a smaller pipes compared to the mass production pipes. So anything could help and anything could bring to an increase. These exhaust pipes were used both on the 3.2 and on the 3.7. It was the same. Here is another example of another exhaust, a different way of giving more power to the engine. And this, this is the engine of the 3700. You can see that basically you see nothing. It is just the same as the original car. This place on 156 with this Auto Delta logo, which is not the Auto Delta of which Ardizio was talking before. It's an English Auto Delta. Now, I don't know why there is this overlapping of names, but this Auto Delta would have acquired the historical old brand of Alfa Romeo. As a matter of fact, the logo is written in the same way as of the old Alfa Romeo. But <laughs> they are in London, not in Italy. I don't know, maybe it, this chart is not very visible, you cannot read it very well. But let's say that it brings the difference, it shows the difference with the, the 3200 and 3700, exactly 3750 cubic centimeters. So the main difference, as you see, is in the bore, which goes from 93 to 101, maintaining the same crankshaft. So relatively not expensive intervention. So the motor, uh, sorry, the engine remained the same. The brakes were more performing, the discs of the brake were more performing, and then there were a partially self-locking differential. And then all the rest which comes for the tires, etc. But let's talk about performances on the 3.7, well, both the 3.2 and the 3.7 are also proposed in a compressor version, not with a, a turbocharged with the exhaust as we are usually used to see, but it had a belt with a centrifugal system. It's a little bit bigger than an alternator. It was placed just on the alternator, which was slightly lowered, and on top the compressor was put, and then there was a, a belt. 
This compressor could generate an overpressure around 0 0.7 or 0 0.8 bars, a little bit less than a turbo. But for some versions, they also tried to, to increase the pressure, even though normally this allowed to go to 400 horsepower around on the 3,700. 400 horsepower is a high number, and the engine does pretty good, even though there were doubts in terms of design. I was just seeing that also the maximum power regime was increased because the revs per minute increase, and this, I would say, per se, we, we never tested a car with these in terms of length, yeah, because the maximum power was around 6,000, it was not necessary to go to 7,000, but there was the limiting element, but yeah, once in a while. But the structure, what was the critical part here? In the fact that the valves can follow the law of the cams. Let's say that from this point of view, the engine was kind of protected. Now, I don't remember the figures, but I think it was 7,003, 7,004. Let's say that in this diagram, okay, in the blue line, we see the performance that the 3700 could have in the suctioning version, around the 320 horsepower. This one instead is a test of 3700 with a compressor for around 400 horsepower. So you see that the maximum power was at 6000 revolutions. So part was also due to the way this compressor worked, because being, uh, well, having a, a belt going to high reps was favorable, but then there was a, a, a limiting device not to increase the revolutions too much. This is 3200 with the version with the compressor. The blue line shows a series of measurements of the performances. Now pay attention to the power degree, because in this case, these were calculated based on the airflow, which was guaranteed. So the 500 horsepower are the horsepower developed in the combustion chamber. It's not those that then when uh, were practically on the street. You have to take away around 90, which is uh, the power which is lost due to friction, internal friction of the engine, etc. So the red line is the 3200, which was then produced. And now we see the other one. This is slightly higher, is the 3700 with the compressor. You go around 500, 540, 550 horsepower, and then you have to deduct the around 90 horsepower of the internal frictions plus 40 more for the movement of the compressor. So the power absorbed by the compressor. And then you arrive at 400 net, which is a good number anyway. Well, some of these cars uh, are still on the streets. 
Of course, the horses, well, the horsepower is high. And in view of a long life of an engine, probably we, we run some risks, but considering the use that you do uh, on these cars of these horsepower, well, it's just to have fun now and then, but they will not run for long kilometers. Well, I thank you very much. Well, Valfredo, you were telling me that there were also some hypotheses or some hypothetical versions that were considered later on. Yes, here, here, look at the logo on top, on the top left. It was a joint venture with General Motors, which went from 2000 to 2005 and brought to the development of what is considered in the world as six cylinders holden. So there would be many, many stories to tell about this. But as you see, there's a Alfa Romeo HFW6, which was the acronym of High Feature V6. There was a GTA option with a turbo, with a power that could go to 350 horsepower at 6,000 revolutions per meter at the maximum torque of 450 Newton meters. It was an hypothesis which was considered. Here we are in 2003. After that, it just died. The engine continued in the 3200 direct injection version, which then went to the Brera in the 159, and which concluded its life on the Brera and on the 159. So this, just to say that the appeal of a GTA version was perceived also from our General Motors colleagues of the time that uh, were in awe when looking at the Alfa Romeo logo. I, I, I worked very well with them. We had also a, a good relationship, also friendship. There's a couple of people who I uh, talk to every year around Christmas time, so it went far beyond our working collaboration. So nothing was done in the end, but the idea was there. And the idea was there way before the presentation of the range, yes, because 3200 old then was then applied in 2005. Yes, exactly. Here we are still in the definition of the grid of the engine. So this engine was born basically for the American market and the European market on Opel and Saab, which talked about the Turbo 2008 version. Then with the joint venture, uh, we arrived 3200 by 3200. The engine was developed here in Arese, at least for the part of the head and the injection. So the lower part was from General Motors powertrain and the engine was then um, produced in Melbourne, General Motors in Australia. But then there's another chapter and it's another story that maybe uh, we can tell another time. Yes, it's a topic that we should discuss in order to debunk some myths. And then in 2002, all them by turbocharge was realized in collaboration with the police. And 3200 by turbo was then uh, approved with well, a couple, maybe three uh, version, um, cars were produced with those horsepowers. We, it's not exposed, but it's part of the uh, collection of the museum. It's a 159 sedan, which has the Brera front and back fenders, and which has some slits on the hoods, on the sides but due to the black coloring, they're almost uh, unnoticeable. 
And then around this NG3400 Alto Delta also built another development towards 3700 with the compressor. It was a, a way more difficult adventure because for the type of injection that they have on this engine, so their injection, there were several limitations and you could not go above a certain power because the engine could not offer uh, deliver enough fuel. But th th there will be another question about this. Well, I thank you for being here and I thank the audience that is welcome to ask their questions. So I see that you are not shy today. I don't know whether I was the first one or not. Well, thanks a lot. I wanted to take advantage of this occasion because on the Busso topic, there's many uh, stories and rumors. And there's a legend which has no confirmation, or at least I have not found a confirmation. But this legend continues to be told. But is it true or not that Cosworth asked to buy all the devices where the V6 finished in Varese. I asked Cosworth, I asked to their press office, because I like to understand things, but I was never considered, they never replied me. I, I give an answer, but I don't give an answer, uh, meaning I remember that when the production was ended, there were some companies interested in acquiring some equipment from the plant, but personally, I don't remember the cost word. I must be honest, I personally don't remember. But I repeat, this is the story that I know. For sure, I remember a couple of companies, there was an Indian one, uh, which were interested, they came here to visit the plant, and the manager of the plant called me also to translate. And then I think nothing was done. So I believe that, well, that unfortunately, <laughs> I saw the plant being emptied completely. So I remember that it was completely empty. There were just some uh, boxes of scrap. What well, scrap? <laughs> there were. Um, all the type of devices and equipment, but those were sold just as metal scrap. And there was just one person who had to complete this emptying. He was just waiting also for uh, the staff and the teams to come to remove the electrical equipment, etc., all the systems. It was very sad. But apart from that, I don't know how to answer. I know that some of them were interested, some companies, and if I'm not wrong, the production area of the cylinder heads, I remember that because, as I said, I was there to translate. But I'm, I'm, I'm honest, I don't remember or I don't know about Cosworth. I don't know. So maybe... Uh, uh, it was above us, but I cannot tell you. Thank you, you're welcome. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing your info. But my question is that 10 horsepower in difference that are declared between the GTA and the normal version, where do they come from? Well, basically, as I said before, on the GTA, a small uh, fine-tuning was done, and this was not done on the 3200, so it was the uh, mechanical timing. So GTA had this characteristic, the other one maintained the timing of the 3000, the original. Uh, what about the... 10 horsepower. Well, we could accept these 10 
horsepower less because uh, uh, displacing the cams, there were 10 horsepower less, but there was a little bit more torque. So on cars like the 166 or the cars not dedicated to be sports cars, you could accept something different. And then there was a commercial element. You, you had to present something different, you know, between the sports version. Otherwise, it, it could not have been justified, the fact of being called sports. Good evening. My name is Andrea. I also thank you. I have the luck of having 147 GTA and 156 sports wagon GTA, which I bought when they were not considered. Oh, you're lucky. Let's say that I went on the racetrack several times with one and the other, but on the same racetrack. Well, the 156 is a Euro 3 and 147 is a Euro 4. Both have an identical engine, so pre cap, etc. Because it's maybe my impression, but 156 flies and the 147 flies a little bit less. So my question is, have you done something between the Euro 3 and the Euro 4? or? But the uh, engines uh, are original, like the cars are original. Well, I, I, I don't have to answer, but the concept is there's a substantial difference uh, with the same modification. No, the question is fit with, if we talk about maximum speed, but even though you have to, you can modify a, a, an engine like this, it doesn't make a huge difference. But if we talk about drivability, about the, uh, response to the accelerator, well, you can do some tricks at the level of electrical part, which gives you the impression of a car that flies and another one that doesn't fly. That's why I'm asking whether the cars are both original. Well, good evening and thanks for your participation. I have a question about 166, the GTA AM of the collection. Only front wheel and the 3.5 or the B turbo that was also present at Shigera. It's the same front wheel with the 3.5 which is mounted on the 156 presented on the Auto Delta Ginevra 2004. And then I don't know whether it has the same specifications, but the engine is that one. Andrea. Hello, Valfrido. Hi, Sergio. Well, first of all, but I invite you. Uh, ask questions because they are the gurus that can tell us all the specifications of the W6, in this case of the 3.2. I wanted to tell you a small anecdote. Uh, Valfrido and Paolo Nati, you said something interesting. So I had an original car uh, bought in 2007, last car of production in 2013. At the time I went to Valduzzi to do the maintenance. Valduzzi was a great friend of Paolo Lanati. And oftentimes he was asked consultancies. So I went to do a regular check and I wanted to know whether it lost some horsepower in the 70, 80,000 kilometers. Balduzzi had a test bench and he said, yeah, no problem. I try tomorrow morning, you come here and I test it. I said, okay, but I said, let's wait, be, wait for me because I want to see and check because I didn't know whether he could do some, would do some tricks. So I was driving to Lotti at one time, at one moment, Balduzzi calls me and he said, where, where are you? I'm almost here. I said, don't come. Why? A, a mess happened. I woke up at five. I wanted to test it at five in the morning. He tested it. Uh, it was cold and he 
melted the 3.2. But I, I went there anywhere because I, I was uh, shaking. I was almost there. I said, what happened? Well, the point is, I asked Paolo Lanati the last year before he passed away. I said, so let's now do it 3.5. And he said, absolutely not. No, the 3.5 is not reliable. If you want, I can uh, give you a preparation. So, and I, I ask you the confirmation because I hope I have a photocopy of the number 21 test room of Arese 2001. So, Valfrido, you were there. Yes, I was there. Where there is a specification at 278 horsepower, 3.2, with specifications of a series of modifications where it, it was 3.2 but there were modifications on the pistons and he told me, why do you want to do the 3.2? Let, let's do the 3.5 since we are uh, opening it. I said, and he said, no, because also you confirmed that it was not reliable. And almost 20 years ago, all the engines that were no longer used, either were uh, phased out by CESA which is uh, authorized by Fiat Auto, and we also bought one at 700 euros, but it was 10 years ago. I, I think number seven, S3500, yes, 80,000 kilometers, 80,000 kilometers. So the W6 worked a lot, but he did allow me to do the modification 3.5. He did the 3.2 enhanced and uh, Oliveri, told me that you thought of doing like a hundred cars to give to the first customers of 156 GTA in 2001 or custom uh, specific customers with 280 horsepower. I want to know whether it's true and just to conclude the 90,000 kilometers 280 horsepower engine but never gave me a problem. But I can answer you in the following way. Well, <laughs> take off the cameras. But it, it was part of these operations that were kind of secret. I didn't take part in this because at that time I was 100% on the Holden. So I was not following the Arese one. So once the GTA started, well, I devoted completely to the Holden. I know that Paolo Lanati worked with the Alpha Corsa group that was here at Arese in Hangar 10. And a colleague of mine was exactly telling me about this. But what? was done, I, I cannot tell you. I cannot tell you because I've always heard that, but I never saw. So it's not that I don't want to say something, but I prefer not to say something I'm, I'm not sure about. But I know that something was made. I, I don't know the details. But if you can give me some time, maybe I can retrieve the information that at the moment I don't have. But I can tell you that with Balduzzi, I don't know whether on your car or others, the calibration, yeah, I did the calibration. But Balduzzi used uh, the big cams and a good phasing. Uh, it's, it looks a little bit exaggerated to say 280 horsepower, but it was around that range. But then if the car was okay and never gave you problems, you have to thank me. But maybe you wouldn't have had problems also with the 3,500. But I repeat, Paolo was kind of strict. He said, no, okay. Maybe it was feelings, guts, I don't know. Good evening. I wanted to know something about 
another thing. So you, you talk about horsepower, but how I have a 147 GTA, I, I race on the tracks, almost only on the tracks I drive it. You talked about the Q4, but not about the Q2, because there was no idea of doing a Q2 or, or because it was not considered to put a Q2, which is less problematic maybe of a Q4 in terms of rooms, differentials, etc. It's a hard question, because then the differential is the weak part of this car. Well, I repeat. Okay, what, what do you mean by Q2? The self-blocking differential? Well, I repeated 147, as I said before, but I just worked on it up to a certain point. And then when I left, if there were other evolutions, I don't know. So let's say that maybe it's more a question not for an engine developer or engineer, but for those who work on the shifts on the gearbox and also the chassis, because the next question is how do you put them on the road? Well, my name is Alessandro. I, I wanted to know something. We did a 3.7 some time ago. We received specifications for Auto Delta, but we had to work on the uh, block, on the heads, uh, and also on the cams. So, what is uh, the engine for which you don't have to do all these amendments? So, the 3.5. Well, the 3.5 can be done on this basis. There's no problems. Apart from what I said before, you know, a narrowing uh, water passage through towards the back cylinder. Well, there's no specific problems from this point of view. So the point, physical point of view, there's no problems. Of course, uh, if you increase, well, 20 years have gone by, by but increasing more the bore to more than 98, there can be some problems of what I call the mandolin. And then if we think at the 3700, where there is one or one a cam, also with 98, we had a, a double thoughts. And of course, you have to do some changes, you, you risk a little bit doing the 101. You do it for the results. But up to 3,500, you can do that with the new camps, the new pistons, uh, 78 um, crankshaft. There's no problem of interference or uh, reduced room between parts and movements. I have m more than one question. One uh, is about Bosso and Holden. Holden had to be a, a stepbrother of Bosso, or these were two different projects. And then 3.2. Is it true that some modifications had already been done and they wanted to uh, be tested on the SZ 1991 was the period? Well, to answer the first question, no. It was not born. How to speak? It was not born as an evolution of the Busso engine. It's a completely new engine. As I said before, the basis was born in the United States General Motors powertrain, which decided at the time to develop this new family of engines, which in the Origin was called the Electron, then HFV6 or High Feature V6, which was a worldwide engine as they defined it because it was produced in several parts of the world the United States, Mexico, Holden. Well, I don't know whether you know it, but the part of Holden no longer exists. The plant shut down a few years ago. I don't remember exactly when. So it was a completely new project. Of course, it's a, a V6, 
when compared to the Busso, it had integral uh, cams, it had double variator for uh, exhaust and suctioning. For the Alfa Romeo application, it had a direct injection. Even though I have to tell you that on this engine, someone tried a, a thought of having a direct injection with the unleaded fuel, just like the uh, B family, which became a direct injection, and someone thought of doing it here. I also have some material I can share about this, but I didn't follow this development personally. I was implied, but not personally. But it was a thought that was made. But I repeat, it's two completely different projects. While the second question, or their hypothesis on the 12 valves, well, in, uh, to be honest, I also found this information. I also found this, in, this information but uh, off the official channels. So I saw an SZ with the 24 valves engine. So someone who did something to the engine exists because I remember an SZ uh, yellow. Well, S -S Z was a coupe and RZ was a spider. Yes, then it was an SZ. Uh, yellow. And I remember I saw an engine. So the 24 valves was born when it had already been changed and tilted because the original boost of 12 valves uh, originally was tilted to be applied on 164, but the 24 valves was already born tilted. So it could not be mounted longitudinally but nevertheless I saw a 24 valves engine uh, mounted longitudinally for an SZ. So I also heard about this, but to be honest, uh, of the official channels, well, uh, bizarre assemblings <laughs> exist. I followed the GTA assembling uh, engine on an Alfetta or, or of the things is, and anyway, it worked. It was a British thing. First of all, again, congratulations. I had a question on the exhaust. I read several times that on the occasion of the presentation of the 156 GTA AM, an exhaust was included realized in collaboration with Super Sprint. Maybe you have some anecdotes. Rumor has it also that it's the same exhaust that Super Sprint uh, offered for the GTA. Well, I don't know specifically this topic, but the Super Sprint is a supplier of parts for several uh, models. It would not be strange if this happened. They were suppliers of mufflers because in the exhaust line, a bit complicated, asymmetrical, because you know there's a long stretch, short stretch, catalyzers, etc. But the weight on the performance is done, done by the and muffler because it has the needs of dampening the noise. There's now rules on the noise that are observed through the construction of labyrinths in the back mufflers. And this is penalizing for the level of performance of the engine, but it's not strange as some uh, builders of mufflers has done something more freely and that the car is even more lively for this. Probably the, the noise will be a little bit different, but it's part of the game. And then that this is used during the presentation of the, uh, of the car, I don't know. 
you should ask the experts how did they do this. But when we saw the 3500 curve, there was a comparison with two different types of uh, terminals. One was a standard GTA and the other was specific. And you see that there was a, an impact on the performances on the entire curve. You know that the exhaust voluntarily generates a pressure, an obstacle to the exhaust gases. And this obstacle is almost all in the back muffler. Hello, my name is Fabio. I also want to congratulate you. Thank you for being us to talk about this spectacular engine. So, someone has something about the Super Sprint exhaust. So I'm going to ask you the following. The Super Sprint sold that exhaust as the exhaust chosen for the GTAM and also suggested by Alfa Romeo. So the Super Sprint also tells that the exhaust was realized in collaboration with you. So now I'm asking you this specific question. Is it true or not? Well, it's hard to remember because many years have passed and many years have gone by. It is true that some builders and producers of uh, exhaust pipes were for marketing their products, even though they were not original spare parts. They came here, at, uh, I mean, uh, to Alpha to test them. And then whether the test went well or not, they marketed it and commercialized them anyway. Or maybe they could say that they had been tested in Alfa Romeo as well. Okay. It's part of the commercial presentation of the products as well. Let's say that as a, a series, man, it was not one of the suppliers, the official suppliers. Uh, one more question? Well, the very last one, I promise. The B6, had it ever been considered to be mounted on a 159 or when the 159 started at the beginning of the 2000s, you immediately thought of a new family of engines? 159, no. It was born as a new family of engines. And and the, the origin is a GM, yes, because the 159 was born on the premium platform, which was developed in Sweden, to which Saab and Opel, uh, as General Motors Europe, adhered to. And then at a certain point, both Saab and Opel uh, withdrew, and only Fiat Auto found itself with this kind of platform and chassis. No, it was not considered and taken into account. I also tell you something else. Mitsubishi was considered with direct injection and someone also talked about BMW, which at the time developed a tilted engine for Rover, if I'm not wrong, which they just acquired. So something arrived in Arese as well. I remember that for Mitsubishi, Paolo went to Japan. I remember that. And uh, it was, that was the choice. But of course, doing the joint venture with General Motors, what engine do you take? Not the BMW or the Mitsubishi. You take the General Motors one, which was being developed and which was at a good point at the 3600 version for the American market. Well, I thank you. I thank all the audience that will follow us on streaming when we will broadcast the conference in Italian and English in a few days. Thank you, Valfrido, Sergio, Nicola. Oh, there, there's one more question. The last one. I like the fact that after a few backstages when you were shy, 
we are now back, but the engine is the engine. How many Euron Cup stars had these cars? Well, I know that the 156 at the time uh, was not tested, while well, the BMW had four stars already, and the 147 didn't have a, a great score. Uh, as far as I know, I, I didn't follow this. The only thing I can say is that the Euron Cup at the time, I don't know now, because I, I don't know, but at the time was not a, a criteria for the standardization and the approval uh, of the car. It was just for journalists, you know, journalists in Venice. So it, it, it had no meaning uh, to distinguish. No, 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 of course, of course. There were cars which had one star or zero stars, okay. But it was not a fundamental criteria for the standard approval. If you pass the, the test, the Aaron Cup was something plus, if I'm not wrong. It was a plus on the product. But it was not something... I don't, I don't remember the figures. But you don't know whether on a 156 if was less safe than a BMW? No, it's not that. It's that I don't remember. And also keeping into account that I had a more than 10 years career, the rules of the Euron Cup change every two years. So, valuations change. There are tests that are invented by journalists and by experts, uh, valid but not codified as tests valid for the standard approval uh, of the car. So if you don't read the, the magazines or you're not updated, you don't even know. For example, the, the, the uh, Mercedes, the Class A Mercedes, the Moos test, it is true. It was not a codified test. Okay, they did something to fix it, but they could not talk bad about a Mercedes product because it was not a standard test. That's it. But I have the answer for the stars of the 147 because in that period I was working in Alfa Romeo. You know that the 147 is also defined with the three, three stars of the Euro and cap, but it's not correct because all the 147 sold were modified. So in the archive, it's post modification Euro and cap. So they were all modified in their chassis. So the test was repeated and the 147 has four stars. I think the questions are really over. No, there's more. <laughs> okay, I, I, I would have a million questions. But can we know something on the by turbocharge engine? What about the boost? So 2.5, 3,000? Why then it was not produced massively? You want to, want, want to answer? Well, he he's the man of the turbo. The fact that they were not brought forward, well, the moment was not favorable for Alfa Romeo. The moment uh, they were developed, it was not a good moment. So when we started working on the by turbo, because the competitors started to do that, well, in the Alfa Romeo, uh, and there was a a preoccupation of costs. That's why these projects were not developed. And another problem was a problem of installation. Because if we think this engine is put inside the front part of this car, the room is limited. It's not putting it by turbo compressor because there's space to do that on the GTV, on the Spider. Uh, of the mid 90s, okay, there was a V6 turbo, but the problem was a problem of uh, all the other implants, the pipes bringing air in and out. And that was kind of problematic, especially on the chassis on which the 147, 156 were developed. 
On the 166, probably there was more freedom. I mean, on the chassis of the 166, there was more was more freedom, but it, it was quite complicated. The other one, as my colleague said, yes, it was a financial reason. I remember that there was a version that, uh, in order to solve the installation problems, had a, an exhaust with an integrated a turbine part, so it was not a separate piece, and we had a, a, a dummy of this at the fifth floor, but the problem was a problem of investments, which were very high, and there was a question mark on the return on investment. So let's say that that's why they were not brought forward, but I remember 2,500, 24 valves, all right, then I remember that something was made on the 3,000 or 3,200 by turbo, and then others I don't remember. But 2,500 I remember there was also a car with that, that engine, maybe on the Holden, uh, uh, well, technically the V6 two valves with a mono turbo was sacrificed. So you have to think that technically you have to think that the hot air is hot air which is cooled then. So a mono turbo V6 is sacrificed. V6 for this engine, the ideal is a bi turbocharged. So technically that is the correct solution because there's three cylinders that have to cross the below part of the engine and go to the other side, you lose energy in this stretch. And in 85, the Alfa Romeo, so at the Courage, we were the only ones, we have to say, the only ones to propose 164 turbo. No one had the Courage. Alfa Romeo did it because we relied on this engine, two valves. But it has it had this handicap you you lost five ten uh, horsepowers but we taught the entire world how to do and then the others <laughs> developed it so in 98 I used the Alfetta and GTV by turbocharger. A guy came from Sweden and said, oh, my friend, come here. I'm going to have you test this car. It was there to do a stage. And he said, it's a GTV, but I was used to test them. And I realized it was a by turbocharger. It was crazy. That was a longitudinal engine. Okay, with some problems because you know that the Alfetta had the crankshaft passing below. Imagine 8,000 revolutions with the transmission passing below. But he came from Sweden to Arese with his GTV. And from there, we insisted on the bi turbocharger. And then there were political decisions, and unfortunately, Alfa Romeo no longer existed. Just one last thing about the bi turbo. When I was a a, a, a guy, I, I remember I saw a Fiat 125, a by turbo, but by turbo was <laughs> a sticker, you know, it was just glued at the back. Fiat 125 with the logo B turbo. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks a lot for your participation. If you want to uh, re watch this <laughs> without asking questions, but, well, you can write questions, you can uh, watch our streaming, endless times on YouTube. Thanks everyone. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.